This morning the topic is interpreting the Bible for all it's worth. There's an overlap, of course, between knowing and interpreting, but I'm going to emphasize something that I've spent a lot of decades working on, um, the, the idea of not merely knowing the content, but being able accurately to realize what it is saying and therefore what God is expecting of us from it. Uh, we want to find out the mind of God. The, the Bible is his book written for us to benefit from, to learn from, but also to learn how to do things from. The Bible is a how-to book. And so whenever you read any book that starts with the words how-to, you should get a warm feeling in your heart, and then uh, you should turn to the Bible. That's the theory. Anyway, but before we get into that, I want to be sure that um, I have a chance once again, just like last night, to start with something relatively hot off the press, a rather new discovery about something in the Bible that is very significant. Now, uh, many of you are aware that uh, there are always critics of the Bible. There are all kinds of people with all kinds of reasons for trying to deny the inerrancy of the Bible, to trying to deny the fact that it really is so remarkably and totally from God that it is always accurate in everything it asserts. And one of the areas that people have tried to deny the truth of the Bible in is the story of the Exodus, that, that Israelites once from Canaan went down into Egypt and grew and grew and grew, and then in very large numbers left Egypt under the leadership of Moses on a human level, but under the direct leadership of God at all times, and uh, went into Canaan. And this occurred in what archaeologists call the Late Bronze Age, the beginning of the Late Bronze Age, and it's actually a, a time period called LB1, or Late Bronze Phase 1, um, which is a time period from basically uh, 1550 to around 1400 BC. That, that, that the Bible says, if you put all the evidence together, that's when these Israelites did that and went into Canaan. But many people have said, oh, where's the proof? Where's the Egyptian evidence? Shouldn't we have in all these hieroglyphic records some evidence of Israelites uh, in Canaan by that time? And uh, the evidence is sparse, but it's sparse for lots of things. Um, sometimes the most basic things are never mentioned in ancient literature. And most ancient record keeping is very tendentious. Government record keeping in the ancient world is always done in a way that favors the government. <laughs> and so you can expect a pharaoh is not going to say, hey, would you please write up about how those Israelites kicked our butts and left uh, uh, and, and make it really uh, honest? No, no, nobody's ever going to do that, except the Israelites. The Israelites in the Old Testament talk about how evil their kings are. Forty-three kings total uh, in Israel and Judah, and uh, only a handful of them are good, and only two of them, Hezekiah and Josiah, are unqualifiedly decent kings. And even they make major mistakes. They're called good, but, they, but mistakes are told about them. So the Bible's brutally honest about government leadership. But it's the only ancient literature where that happens. Anyway, so people said, where's the Egyptian uh, evidence of any defeat? Well, there's no Egyptian evidence. They never admit defeat. Anyway, um, I know that most of you will be able to follow this stuff that I'm going to lecture on, which involve for just a few minutes now, a short, sort of mini lecture, that involves uh, Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics. But I did meet somebody this morning who said that she hadn't yet gotten very far in her study of hieroglyphics, so I'll explain. Uh, for, for, this is for Marsha, uh, who, who just needed a little bit of... First, I want to show you a, a title page from an article. This is from the Journal of Egyptian Interconnections. I know it's a journal probably most of you have subscriptions to, but for those who don't, look at the fact that we've got uh, three writers of an article, three uh, Egyptologists, people who specialize in this as an academic career at German universities joining together 
to write an article. That alone is unusual in the humanity, humanities, to have three authors. Sometimes you get co-authors, that's pretty rare, but this is super rare uh, to have three, and three Egyptologists write together. Now, a lot of people know Egyptian. I know Egyptian, I've taught Egyptian, but I'm not an Egyptologist. I don't spend my days and nights like these people do, saying, wow, look at that hieroglyphic, or wow! <laughs> you know, oh, look at that Pharaoh, he's criticizing that Pharaoh, oh, this is fun. They, they, they just, <laughs> they breathe this stuff. 3,000 year old is just modern for them. They're going back 4,000, sometimes even 5,000 years. You know, writing in the ancient world was invented by two groups, the Sumerians in about 3200 BC and the Egyptians independently in about 3200 BC. So you can go back past 5,000 years, and if you're an Egyptologist, you say, nah, we're cooking. Anyway, three guys get together. Now, there are only about 60 full-time Egyptologists practicing in the world. So here is 5% of all the world's Egyptologists agreeing together on an article. It's really amazing. And uh, here's what they're looking at. They're looking at um, this thing on something called the Berlin pedestal. I can tell you all about the history of it, but it wouldn't make much of a difference. But you see that there are these sort of long oval-shaped things. Those are called cartouches, and that's something that the Egyptians used to put the names of people and countries into. So this cartouche on this particular document from around 1200 BC or so is a cartouche that contains the name Ashkelon. Ashkelon is mentioned in the Bible, one of the five big cities of the Philistines. So it's describing coastal Palestine. And then in the center is another cartouche, and this one has the, uh, the wording Kana'anu in it, meaning Canaan. And then over on this side, on the right of the picture, we get uh, something that's partly broken off, but obviously it's a cartouche because you can see about 60% of it, and it's the name of some other country. So you've got this country, Ashkelon, that's the, the Egyptians called uh, the, what we would call the area of the Philistines in Bible times. They called that Ashkelon. That was their word for it. And then they, they certainly referred to Canaan. They knew that territory. And then there's this third territory. Now, the, the name for Ashkelon, as I'm sure most of you have already noticed, when you, you say, you looked at that and you said, oh, that's written in archaic um, uh, hieroglyphics. That's an old style of hieroglyphics. And you're absolutely right. Good for you for noticing. <laughs> and in the middle one, the word Canaan written the same way. So what's going on on the right side? Well, here's a close-up of what's on the right side. You can see part of it you can tell, and then part of it's broken off. And, and um, these Egyptologists looked very carefully at this and said, wait a minute, that looks like, and then all they had to do was simply say, we can tell pretty easily, since we get about half of the letters on the right-hand side of this thing where there is a break, we can tell something that... Uh, in the past, um, Egyptologists overlooked. They didn't bother to think much about what's in the third cartouche. What name appears there? Now, it's not Cincinnati, <laughs> very likely, anywhere, and uh, it's not Berlin itself or anything. This, is, this just goes way back into the second millennium B.C., so they said, we can tell what this is. And so, uh, first of all, uh, uh, just to, now this is just for, uh, for Marcia, by the way. The rest of you, I know it's very repetitious for me to point this out. But um, if you see that thing that looks sort of like a, a meat cleaver, it's actually representing a stalk of a certain plant. And that's the way in Egyptian you say either Y or I. Egyptian's interesting in that you know how in English the letter Y can be a consonant sometimes, y, or at the end of a word like tricky, it's actually a vowel and it's pronounced E. Well, in, in the middle of the uh, second millennium BC, around 1500 BC, the way you would have said Israel is to say Yisrael. 
Our word in English, Israel, comes through a lot of other languages and gets mutated some. But you would have said uh, the way Jacob would have said it, his name. He would have said, my name is Yisrael. That's how he would have said it. And so um, there's the Y sound. And then this uh, uh, hawk-like bird over here is, is a sound for a, ah, so it's ya. And then this thing in the middle, which looks like a slab with uh, three um, uh, lights pointing up from it or something, uh, spotlights pointing, is actually a lotus pond. That's, a, that's a, supposed to be a pond with some flowers floating on it. And so uh, that's the sound shar. And then there's another plant stalk here. So this one, however, is in the middle of a word, so you pronounce it e. And then finally, this r. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I know you know it's an R, but I need to explain it to Marsha. This sound that looks sort of like a mouth with only a thin lipstick spread is um, R or L. Egyptians, like Japanese and Chinese, had a sort of an R-L interchange. So this is pronounced Yashar-il, Yashar-il. And they said, Yashar-il? That's an old way to write the word Israel. And so they said, boy, it's an old way to write the word Ashkelon, an old way to write the word Canaan, and here's an old way to write the word Israel. The slab it's on was probably actually uh, put together around 1200 BC or so, but they say, but, but it has to be copied because by 1200 BC, the spelling had changed. Now, you know, in ancient Egyptian, and in fact, most languages of the world, spelling changes happen. Did you ever look at Chaucer or some old English and see how things were spelled then as opposed to how we spell them now? There's that progression of spelling, which is called uh, orthography, the study of orthography, the history of spelling. Well, in the history of spelling out uh, hieroglyphics, um, they said, this has got to be copied from something at least as old as 1400 BC. And they have to this article that I've just shown you a little bit of, uh, 89 footnotes at great length demonstrating, as Egyptologists love to do, um, all of the reasons why uh, this is from a time like 1400 or 1500 BC. And they, are, they have demonstrated in this article very persuasively that Egyptians around that time, around the very time the Bible says Israel had gotten into the land of Canaan and was beginning to conquer it, the days of Joshua and thereafter, which would be 1400 BC and thereafter by the usual way of reckoning the count. And if you want to understand this, you have to buy my commentary on Exodus. I mean, honestly, do you want to be an educated adult or not? Anyway. Um, <laughs> So I've, I've got it there, but 1400 B.C. works, and they say that's how you would write the name Israel in 1400 B.C. What other nation could it possibly be? You have the Philistines, you have the Canaanites, and who's the other group? It's Israel. This is proof for the fact that we have Israelites at that early period. And so in the conclusion of their article, they say at the very end, naturally, further evidence will be, everybody says that, you're an idiot if you don't write that in your article. Naturally, further confirmation, we all write that. But um, they say you've got Ashkelon, you've got Canaan, the obvious third choice is Israel, there it is sitting there spelled in the old way that it would normally be spelled at that time period. Proto-Israelites, in other words, the very first people of that nation, um, the, the nation that God had brought together and multiplied, um, uh, getting on its way to be like the, the sand pieces along the ocean uh, or like the stars in the sky. Uh, there they are in, in the middle, middle of the second millennium B.C. in late bronze one. Now, the challenge is for anybody to say, there's no mention of Egypt in the Egyptian literature. They're there. There are all kinds of things like this. And little by little, they come out. This is very recent, just published a few years ago. Um, it, it is a reminder. It's not proof that the whole Bible's true because it's only about this part of the issue. But it's a reminder that if we knew enough, if we could find all the evidence, we would be bombarded with 
confirmation of the scripture and its truth. You can trust the word of God. Now, we move on to the interpreting the Bible for all it's worth. As I said last night, people are always asking me, what else can I read? Uh, I recommend the article Exegesis in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. That's a multi-volume uh, major Bible dictionary uh, because I wrote it. And then the next book, <laughs> Old Testament Exegesis, which is the best-selling uh, book on exegesis by Westminster John Knox. I recommend that as well because I wrote it. And then the third one, uh, New Testament exegesis, unfortunately I didn't write, but I wish I had. It's by Gordon Fee, uh, with whom I wrote the other books, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, How to Read the Bible book by book. So um, it's not that I recommend my own stuff uh, purely for uh, at the financial gain. That's about 98% of the reason, but... <laughs> Uh, it's actually because I, I hope I did a good job of writing those things that I wrote, and I know Gordon did of his part. And we're going to deal today with something called exegesis. Now, I do want to give you a little bit of a story. And the story is about this book, Old Testament Exegesis. Um, there were books on the, the topic, and any of you who've gone to seminary or are thinking about going to seminary may understand that one of the things that you do in seminary is you learn this process called exegesis, and normally you write several exegesis papers to show you know how to do it. Exegesis is the close, careful, analytical study of a chunk of Scripture with the goal of learning everything you can reasonably learn about it. That's what exegesis is, a real, careful, detailed study looking at it from every angle. Well, um, I felt the books and articles on exegesis weren't very good, so I put together a guideline for my students. Um, th this now is a lot of years ago, and uh, the students loved it. They were very appreciative, and I was grateful. I thank God for the fact that it seemed to click with them. And, uh, and then um, uh, a liberal publisher, Westminster John Knox, is not evangelical in any way, but they picked it up. They liked it. And, and um, so it began to sell well and so on. It's gone into fourth editions now, and I have a contract to bring it into a fifth edition. So uh, it's, it's constantly selling, which is a wonderful thing, and lots of people using it, and it, it is the most widely used uh, thing in the world. But when I wrote it, I did something that I knew was dangerous. And that is, I said, the exegesis process must go all the way to and conclude with application. And nobody had done that before. Nobody. Uh, they all said, oh, application, that's hermeneutics. But uh, exegesis is just very careful, kind of uh, elaborate study. What did this say? What might it have meant to the people who read it at the time? And so on but not what do you do about this? How do you take this and put it into action and thus glorify God by living the good works that he has called you to, uh, as Ephesians 2.10 says. So, but I added it in because I really firmly believe the final result is that we do something with our knowledge. The final result, you take it somewhere and you begin to serve God. His word is to make you a different person who acts differently. That's one of its wonderful purposes. So I added it in with much trepidation and then waited for the reviews. Uh, the, the publishers accepted it. That was good. Uh, they sometimes reject things like that, and, and, but they, they let that go through. And the first review that came out came out in what is the biggest worldwide journal called the Journal of Biblical Literature, the JBL. And uh, it was written by a very competent New Testament scholar, even though it's an Old Testament, uh, they gave it to him, uh, named Richard Solon. And Solon started his review this way, throw away whatever you've been using and get Stuart's book. If you're a writer, you can't have a better review than that. <laughs> but people took his advice and the book began to sell, and he loved the idea that I had included application. And everybody else has accepted it since then. And so uh, uh, it was something I just believed in and with great trepidation decided to include, and, and it has, in effect, produced something of a revolution in thinking about 
what the term exegesis, which is another term for careful, careful work to be sure your interpretation is right, that term now includes in most people's minds, I hope, uh, who've read the book, the um, idea that you do something with the knowledge. So we're today gonna go through and talk about that process. I'm gonna hit you fire hose style with a lot of stuff. And I'm gonna give a lot of illustrations that'll be so fast that you may get interested in them but not have any idea what in the world I used for proof. Um, but you can just trust me because I'm so wonderful and honest, you really wouldn't need proof except my words. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not that way. You really ought to challenge anything and be cautious about anything anybody tells you. That's just being smart. But we're going to look at under words, not just the fact that, of course, you've got to read the words of the Bible, but how you break that down, how you mince that up into small bits, something about text and translation and lexical content and grammar. That's part of a process. And we do these steps in the process as well as we can with the knowledge that we have at any given time. And you hope you get better and better through your lifetime, but you start where you are, and in many cases, you're only a consumer of advice and information that some commentator or scholar gives you, or that a Bible, uh, a study Bible gives you. Maybe that's, that's the level at which you can, it's wonderful. You start where you are, you work with what you've got, but these are the steps you go through. And then there's context. There's an old saying that seminarians usually know called, context is king. But I always say, no, Christ is king. Context is queen. Uh, that's the way it ought to be said. Anyway, historical context, literary context, biblical context, theological context. I'll give examples of each of these. So we're going to talk about words and how that breaks down into categories. We're going to talk about context, how that breaks down into subcategories. Then there's the issue of format. How does it come? What is the format? What is the way the material is organized? So there's the general genre rules, and we, uh, anybody who's read How to Be the Bible for All It's Worth knows that's a special aspect that we really concentrate on in that book. But there's also within that the particular individual literary form, and then the structure. How has God inspired some human being to organize the material? Because you get part of the message, only part, but part of it simply by the order you see it in, the way it appears in a, a paragraph or a chapter or the book itself or whatever. And then there's the question of support. Um, what else can help you? Who else can help you? What are the books you can read? What kinds of resources can you use? What sorts of aids can you turn to? And even under what conditions do you do this? Makes a difference. Um, one of the reasons people will sometimes uproot uh, from wherever they may live in the world and come to a place like Gordon-Conwell. I understand some even go to Trinity, but come to a place like Gordon-Conwell and, and make a ma major life change is because they sense that the context of a seminary, a kind of special withdrawal from many things to focus in that setting will be helpful to them. Uh, and so that's worth asking. And then finally, application. So, that's always a great question to ask. When you listen to a sermon, at the end of it say, so? When you do your own Bible study, at the end of it say, so? When you read a book that someone's telling you something about Scripture, say, so? When you read part of the Bible, ask, so? Uh, you're supposed to. That's, that's the thing to ask. Don't leave that question off. So let's not forget that one. Okay, now I'm going to take you through each of those steps. So uh, the steps were uh, text translation, lexical content, grammar, uh, historical, uh, literary, biblical, and theological context, the general f rules, form, structure, who else can help, and then so, and don't forget the so, that's important. Okay. <laughs> Under text, I'm going to give examples. Now, I've picked what I think of as vivid, powerful, illustrative examples. Don't make the uh, mistake of assuming that every verse is like this. Because I may give you 
some interpretations, some information about a new way to understand something um, that a seminary student might have learned already, but if you're not a specialist, you might not know it. But don't think, oh my goodness, he gave us a bunch of different illustrations of things. I hadn't heard those before. I guess the Bible is totally up for grabs. No, no. These are selected illustrations, so please understand that. Uh, most of it everybody can agree on. But uh, to be as accurate as we can, we ought to be as diligent as we can, and I've just selected some things that illustrate what you can get out of these various steps of the process. So, the step of text, that is where you look at the question, what are the original words? Do we know them for sure? The Bible was copied and copied and recopied and recopied, and there are thousands of manuscripts, and sometimes people made mistakes. God did not say, I will prevent every idiot from idiocy. He doesn't do that today, doesn't do it for me, doesn't do it for you. Uh, we have his treasures in, quote, earthen vessels, uh, you know, very valuable stuff, his word, and he's entrusted it to people like us. When you lead a Bible study, I hope you will say, oh, Lord, please help me, because I don't know this stuff as well as I should, uh, because I sure think that about everything I do, except this lecture where I'm very, very confident. <laughs> anyway, there are Greek manuscripts that say different things. Romans 8.28 is a wonderful verse, but most people have memorized it to say, uh, all things work together for good. So, and somehow, everything that ever happens is good. So, if I should pull out an Uzi now and, and kill 86 people, it, you, uh, some people would say, oh, it's for the good. Well, it's not. The Bible says all kinds of things are bad. They are not good. They're not things that seem like they're bad, but are actually good. They're bad. God says they're bad, it's a fallen world, and it's subject to futility, it's corrupt, there's all kinds of things. That's the world we live in. So is that what Romans 8.28 is saying? And the answer is, the better manuscripts say, in all things, God is at work for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So of course there's lots of evil, and of course there's lots of terrible things that happen, but God is never unaware and is never stopping to work for good. So yes, we're in an evil world, and yes, we're in Satan's prison planet, but God's on our side at work with us to make things good. It's just a more realistic, helpful understanding of that verse. There's something where knowing the original wording and doing the work that scholars can do makes it work. Now, it's a lot of work to do text criticism. It's a kind of a specialty. So, of course, you're not going to necessarily do this yourself, but be aware when a commentator or a study Bible writer says the better reading in the original is, be open to that. Because from time to time, it'll really be helpful. Let me give you another one. Um, there's the term in Paul's writing where he talks about the works of the law. People are dedicated, he says, to, the, to uh, obeying the works of the law. Well, uh, a lot of people who uh, are New Testament scholars and don't want to evangelize Jews, that's the underlying actual agenda, have said, let's not evangelize Jews, that's embarrassing to us. We, they, don't, they wouldn't evangelize anybody anyway, but they certainly wouldn't evangelize Jews. These are leftist New Testament scholars. So they have come up with the idea, what it is called the new perspective on Paul, and they say, oh, all he means by the works of the law are things that separate Jews from the rest of us, that are barriers to inclusivity. And so these are Sabbath keeping, you know, rigid Sabbath keeping, circumcision, and then kosher eating. That's all he means. But uh, eventually, uh, Dead Sea Scroll scholars noticed in a document called 4QMMT, which is from Cave 4 at Qumran, and I know probably, what, 80, 90 percent of you have been to Qumran, and so, you know, if you just stand there at the center of the site and you look up, kind of straight like that, you see cave four right ahead of you, as you will remember. Anyway, um, from cave four of the 11 caves, um, they found this document, and it talks about the works of the law. 
Ma'ase HaTorah in Hebrew, and uh, it's the exact phrase that Paul is using in its Greek equivalent. And it's talking generally about the law, not merely about those three barrier practices. And so it simply blows the whole notion of the new perspective on Paul out of the water. So if you want to, tonight when uh, Don Carson speaks, just say, what's your opinion on 4QMMT and the uh, new perspective on Paul? He'll tell you just what I said, and then you can say, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I just thought I'd help you in advance. I mean, that's useful, don't you think? Okay, then, now we're moving fast. I, I, that's all I'm going to say about that, but we're, we're on to translation, a second of a dozen steps here in this process. And I'm just trying to give you an overview, a very fast overview that gives you a feel for the different steps, all of which may be entirely relevant, maybe sometimes some more than others, maybe a few or a couple particularly relevant to any particular problem, but this is what a scholar does in writing a, a commentary. This is what um, a pastor does, hopefully, in using the knowledge he or she has obtained over the years studying this, uh, tries to do, and from these kinds of steps is where they get their sermons uh, and where uh, people get the information. They do this, and you can do it too. You can do it in some fashion, even if you're just starting. And you can certainly appreciate it when you see it. Okay, step two, translation. Um, I gave a set of lectures at Dallas Seminary. Uh, that's yet another seminary. You know, there are actually more than just Gordon-Conwell and Trinity. There really are. I'm not kidding you. There's one down in Texas named Dallas. And I was there uh, a couple of years back and gave um, uh, a, a set of lectures called My Favorite Mistranslations. Uh, those are all on YouTube, but they're also published in a journal uh, that it says, what does that say? Bibliotheca Sacra, um, which is a, a Latin term for something or other. No, it means Holy Bible, actually. Um, so anyway, uh, or Holy Library is more carefully the translation. I just want to give a couple examples. We have, of course, the statement in the Bible in Genesis 1, let's create man in our own image, God says. The word that's used there it's the Hebrew word tselem, T-S-E-L-E-M is the way you might spell it out in English. Uh, that's a standard word for idol. And so when I look at that in Hebrew, and what I think most Hebrew scholars, they say, let's create man as our idol. What's an idol? An idol is a thing that represents a god. And that's what people understood. What represents a god? Well, God says, we do. Idols, the things that the pagans came up with, were stupid little statues of various kinds and pictures and engravings and all kinds of things that represented what they thought were gods. And they worshiped those, and the Israelites constantly mocked them for being so stupid, except when the Israelites did it themselves and then kept their mouths shut. Um, there's a whole system about idolatry. Why were people so attracted to it? Why is it a big thing to be warned against in the Bible? But you'll have, just have to invite me back, and I'll give you a lecture on the attractions of idolatry. And at the end, you'll understand why in the ancient world pretty much everybody wanted to practice idolatry. But because they wanted the gods to be there. This is our job assignment. If anybody in this audience wants to know, why am I on this earth? Who am I as a human being? What's my purpose? The answer is, your purpose is to represent God on this planet now. He wants you to represent him. Most people aren't doing it. Most people aren't even aware that that's their purpose, but that's what the sentence means. Let's, us, let's create man as our uh, image, our idol. Let's put them on earth to represent us on this awful, wicked planet that Satan and his demons are already occupying. So we've been parachuted in behind enemy lines to serve God as his representatives. A tselem, an image, is a representation, a representative. And that's what it means. Well, that's a wonderful thing. If you know that, you get something. 
And you don't just get a sort of curiosity answered. You get a job assignment. You know who you are and what your purpose is. So uh, we know that we are aliens here. We don't belong. This is not where we ultimately going to be, but, but we're pilgrims for now. We're resident aliens temporarily, and our ultimate purpose is to represent God because his kingdom is not of this world, but he's got people who belong to it, us, here, to make it as much like it can be fallen as it is according to his purposes. And then the term prostitution. People mistakenly think that Hosea married a prostitute, but it doesn't say, that doesn't use any of the normal words for prostitute, but it says instead, marry a woman of prostitution, have children of prostitution, the whole country's gone way into prostitution, and uh, you just need to know that prostitution is a standard, used dozens and dozens of times, a standard biblical metaphor for idolatry. Idolatry is serving other gods, trying to use the images and the purposes of other gods uh, to gain things. And God says, my people Israel have gone into idolatry in a big, big way. And so this is an enactment prophecy where Hosea symbolizes this by, in effect, saying, anybody I marry will be tainted by idolatry. Any of the kids I have are going to be tempted by it and face, uh, it'll be in their face all their lives. There's so much idolatry. That's what the story is about. Gomer was a, probably a person, a perfectly nice uh, person who worked in a local cafe as a waitress on weekends or something. There's nothing about, she didn't sell sex, she was just a person. Okay, lexical content. Now, again, I haven't proved all that, but I did write a brilliant commentary on Hosea where it's all laid out for you. Uh, lexical content, a third step in the process. You want to understand individual words and what they mean all by themselves. And then, of course, you put them in the translation context. But an example is the word 40. It is sometimes, literally, 10 times 4, but often is the Israelite way of saying a whole bunch or many dozen. So sometimes it's not specific. And in the flood story, rain, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. It can mean something on the order of, it just rained for weeks and weeks on end, never ceasing either day or night. That's what it means. It doesn't have to be exactly 40. And the word thousand can have that kind of meaning as well. In, in um, uh, the example given here, uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousand. That's a kind of a big deal in 1 Samuel. Um, it really means just a fighting unit. And sometimes those fighting units were only 20 or 30 people. It's the number of people that would typically be in a small village uh, or a, a small neighborhood in a city to fight. And, and that helps you understand even the numbers that the Bible's talking about in connection with the Exodus. And, but you know what people think is somehow symbolic, the number seven. Seven. You get, when you say seven, the best way to say it is like this. Seven. Because <laughs> they, they just think of it, wow, and three. But those are actually never symbolic in any way. Um, they're used in various patterns. You can have patterns, and I'll talk about that shortly. But seven is just a way of saying several. It really is a, a, a group, a small group. And three is the way of saying uh, uh, a couple, the way we would say a couple, or we might say two or three. So you got to be careful how you use words. The commentaries will help you. The Bible, uh, study Bibles will help you with this. Okay, we're on to grammar. Again, I'm, I'm giving this real quick, but I'm giving you examples. I'm trying to give you a feel for each of the steps and the sorts of things that uh, those steps help you discover. And God saw that it was good. That phrase, you know, is used all over Genesis 1, but it's used in some other places in the Old Testament too. It's a certain kind of pattern in the Hebrew. And you know what it actually means idiomatically? And I've written on this in my Exodus commentary and elsewhere. It means, and God loved it. To say, saw that it was good, it is a literal translation or literalistic translation, but it doesn't have the punch of the original. The original really is saying, um, he created this, and he loved it. And he created that, and he loved it. And he created people, and he loved us. 
It's John 3.16 in Genesis 1. That's what that phrase really means. To see something that it's good means you love it. And I think it's a very provable thing, and it's interesting, and I wrote on it. So uh, it's a vivid example to me of just doing your grammar study. And the wonderful message, the encouraging message in Genesis 1 is not only that uh, we live in a fallen world with all its problems, but God is with us in it, but that we are his representatives, but also that he loves it and he loves us. And isn't that obvious that from Genesis 1 onward, we're oriented. Sure, it's a bad world. Sure, all kinds of people are evil. There's tons of sin. People are misusing and abusing each other, and there's so much that's crummy and terrible, and there's so many painful things we may feel, and so much potential for loneliness even in a crowd. Just so many things that are hard. But God loves the world, and we're his representatives to love it as well. What a message. So if you only knew Genesis 1 with the good enough grammar knowledge, you got a marching order already. And the rest of the Bible fills it out and fills it out and fills it out with, to overflowing with rich opportunity for you and me to have a purpose in life and to know that that purpose relates to our belonging to God. Or... In a New Testament example that involves Greek grammar, <clears throat> we have the expression, uh, our great uh, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, a, a guy named Granville Sharp demonstrated uh, over a century ago that the Greek grammar means that Jesus is called our God. You know, there have been some people who tried to say, meh, there isn't really any place where Jesus is directly called God. He says, I and the Father are one, but that could sort of mean like my dog and I are one, you know. We love each other and get along well. No, no. It, 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 he really does mean God and I are one. I really am divine. But um, this is a grammatical reference um, that absolutely proves it by the structure in Greek of that particular expression. So those are examples of things you learn from grammar. Okay, we're on to context. So we actually did several steps already, and if you're not asleep or don't have it memorized yet, I'm going to continue. Okay, historical context. Um, you shall love Ashurbanipal as yourselves, said a great 8th uh, century uh, um, Assyrian king. That's the language that we understand, loving your neighbor as yourself. But, you know, it's not just saying, oh, Louise, I just think you're wonderful. I think of you all day long. You are the sweetest thing. Oh, my goodness. And Bob, isn't he a stud muffin? He is such a nice guy. <laughs> uh, that, it's not some emotional thing. It's a matter of loyalty. That's what it means to love somebody as yourself. We have this expression from elsewhere in the historical context of the Bible, and we know what it means. And I give you an example from the Amarna letters. This is from early uh, 14th century B.C. Such and such a king now loves such and such a king and didn't love them. These are kings talking about being allies of each other, shifting alliances in a time of war. And it's been written on in this article. I, I always try to uh, give you where you could read further by William Moran, that article, uh, describing the whole business of how the terminology of love is about loyalty and obedience and faithfulness. That's what it is. So to love God with all your heart is not to say, oh, God, ooh, every time I think of you, I just feel so much love. I go, oh, you are... No, you can say, you know, God, I don't feel like anything today, but I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be loyal. I'm not going to abandon you because you never abandoned me. That's the point. And, and so it is with loving your neighbor as yourself, which just, a neighbor, by the way, I could have done that, is it, it, just any other person who's on the planet. The, the word in Hebrew does not mean somebody nearby. It means your fellow human being. That's really what the word neighbor in the original actually means. And uh, here's another example at the bottom of the page. Some of you know from Daniel, there's this handwriting on the wall and a story about the final Babylonian king, and, he, and, he, and he's at a banquet, and everybody's drunk, and then they see this handwriting on the wall, scares them all. 
and it's uh, these words that most people pronounce, meeny, meeny, tikal, ufarsin, it's actually mene, mene, tekel, farsin. And here's the meaning, the equivalent of it in our day would be dollar, dollar, dime, nickel. The way the Aramaic is written, and that's Aramaic, is uh, ambiguous, because Aramaic's written without vowels. And so the, the words looked to all the people who tried to read it like dollar, dollar, dime, nickel, because they, these are all words for monetary amounts in one way that you can vocalize them. And they all said, what is that supposed to mean? Here we are, it's the end of our empire practically, and the Persians are at the gates, and we're, our armies are fighting, and this is one last banquet. And uh, somehow, and a disembodied hand scare, scaring the daylights out of us writes, dollar, dollar, dime, nickel. What's that supposed to mean? $2.15 is what? What is the point? And, but no, because the word uh, uh, mene, which can mean uh, mina, the dollar, quote unquote, can also mean uh, mene or, or um, uh, a particular kind of word uh, that, that means uh, weighed and found wanting and so on, all the things in the in interpretation that um, are then given by Daniel because God is the one who caused the thing to be written. So without giving you lots of detail on how it all works out, it, it really is a, a way of saying um, you're in trouble now. <laughs> this is the end of the, of the Babylonian Empire. Sorry if you looked. Uh, that, that's what it means. Well, historical context allows you to know that, to know why it was nobody could figure out the meaning. Uh, not that they couldn't read the words, they just didn't read the right vocalization. Okay, literary context. Um, there are ways in which things are written. Uh, in the book of Job, there's a frame pattern. At the beginning of the book, there's a couple of chapters in prose, and at the end, there's a chapter in prose, but in the middle, it's all poetry, dialogue and poetry. Job never knows why he's tested. We know because we get to read the first half of the frame. And we know that his faithfulness under horrible suffering honored God and gave God great delight. All that suffering, and he's sticking with me. And that was a display in heaven to the evil forces. Think of that. When you suffer, it might just be that everybody in heaven is saying, good for you, stick with it. But you don't hear that. It would be just very nice if once in a while we'd get a, good for you. <laughs> stick with it, Doug, because I'm honored by your faithfulness. Instead, what I get is, anyway. <laughs> but then if God did that, I'd say, oh, I feel fine now. It's just like, just like going to the dentist. But when you really want to suffer, uh, then don't know why. Job doesn't know either. The frame tells you that. Or Ecclesiastes. It looks like there's all this negative stuff in the middle of Ecclesiastes, and there is. It's cynical wisdom. It's an example of cynical thinking about the nature of life. But at the beginning, it describes the uh, preacher, the Ecclesiastes guy, Koheleth, uh, and says, here's what he did and what he was like, and here's, we're going to tell you now what he said. And at the end, it says, now, looking back on what he said, well, uh, be sure you don't get confused by this. Be sure that you remember this was a, 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 an example of cynical thinking, but your job is to love God, keep his commandments. That's your duty. And so the frame on either end allows you to understand the nature of the, uh, the stories in the middle. Same with Job. In Job, there's all kinds of bad advice in the middle of the book because three people are giving him bad advice for 30-some chapters, and then a fourth person comes and gives him even worse advice for several chapters before God finally speaks and says, Job, do you, th after he speaks for several things, he talks about all the control that he has over the world and all the, the power of creation and the significance of it. He says, do you think I know what I'm doing? And Job says, fine, that's all I need to know. I need to know that you know what you're doing. I don't need to know anything else. And, and that's really the ultimate answer for suffering now while we're in this world. Biblical context. 
you've got to know where your passage and, and the things you're talking about fit in the whole context. And an example of this from Revelation is the description of Satan. He's called a dragon. Well, there are ways in which that works with the book of Job and other places. He's called the ser serpent or snake. That's the Garden of Eden uh, uh, personality that he takes upon himself and, and image and picture. He's called the devil, and he's also called Satan, which means enemy. And so here's John using four different terms for Satan to try to say the person I had this image about, this revelation about, this picture of, this vision of, is that same person who shows up in these various places throughout the Scripture. It's all that same evil guy, and he's being bound so that the gospel can go to the whole world and everybody can have a chance to hear the gospel. Satan cannot stop the good news. That's what that chapter is about. And so he's saying, no matter how much we may have learned to fear him throughout Scripture, we cannot ever worry that he can stop the gospel. You, you tell the gospel to somebody, God has provided that he can't stop that from happening if you're faithful. His word will work. Or from Luke, Jesus saying he taught them in all the scriptures. Well, that's the Old Testament. And there is evidence to us that in one way or another, the Old Testament leads to Christ. It doesn't mean that every statement in the Old Testament is about Jesus. That's not it. But that everything in the Old Testament either tells us what we should be looking for, or what was needed, what didn't work, and therefore you realize how much you're longing for a wonderful king like Jesus, and so on. There's some way in which it relates to him. Theological context is separate as well. Um, the phrase, don't boil a goat kid in its mother's milk. I know a number of you have taken this as a life verse, but uh, you may not understand fully the meaning. You know that Jews today, Orthodox Jews, um, still take this seriously. It's mentioned in three different places, as you see here, and they say, this must mean in our day, that we should never mix dairy and meat in the same meal. And so that's a standard practice of Judaism, never mix the two. But it's actually a Canaanite magical ritual. They tried to uh, increase the fertility of their flocks by taking goat kids and boiling them in their mother's milk on the theory that this would produce a kind of fertility. And you could go into all the detail of why that would work. That's what it is. Well, knowing the fact that it occurs in various places and why, the, the theological context tells you it's somebody's bad theology, and that's what the Israelites are being warned against. Or the reference to the gods of Egypt. You know, every one of the ten plagues is showing God's power over a force of nature that the Egyptians thought was a god, because the Egyptians, like most ancient people, were pantheistic. And they thought that everything that moved was a god. If you're an Egyptian, you say, wow! And you see this little beetle pushing a dung, a little ball of dung along, because there is a thing called a dung beetle. They saw that, and they said, that has got to be worshipped, and they did. That's the scarab, and the Egyptians worshipped scarabs. So when they saw a dung beetle, they said, I I'm with you, I've been, I've been a good boy. And the dung beetle just pushes the dung ball along and so on. Oh, man. I must be in good with those dung beetles. Anyway, uh, everything's a God. And here we have the Lord, the God of the Israelites, showing that they're powerless against him. Boy, if you know that, that's, the, that's theology. That's wonderful stuff. Or Paul's reference to the way that uh, we have a body. We're not just a bunch of people in a, some kind of a mind net for eternity, we have individuality, and, and our resurrection bodies, which are spiritual bodies, will continue that. It's a wonderful thing. Genre and form. Um, where do you uh, find the genre rules and, and know them? Well, that's why we wrote the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. So having talked about that and you're having available to buy it, and, and I recommend buying several copies, as you know, uh, from the uh, ask them for a 10% discount for something over 100. They'll undoubtedly oblige you out there in the book. Um, and then form, the specific forms. Uh, lots of times you get the expression, thus says the Lord. 
Um, but it's a way of saying, I, the prophet, didn't make this up. I'm just the messenger. God put these exact words in my brain. So I'm now about to say exactly what God is saying to you. Not, God gave me a general idea and I've made up the, the particulars. Oh, no. Listen, I didn't make up any of this. That's very important, that, that form, just the wording like, thus says the Lord or says the Lord or whatever. Or enactment prophecies, which I said I would talk a little about. There's one in Ezekiel 37 where he just takes two sticks and, and, and he puts them, one sticking out this end of his hand and the other that end of the hand. So when he holds it, you don't see the place in the middle where they're joined. You just see this stick and it looks like one stick. It's so simple. But it's a vivid illustration of a truth. And there are lots of these. Um, Isaiah going around, quote, naked, really meaning what we would call the equivalent of wearing underwear. And every once in a while, for three years, he'd show up wearing underwear in public. And it's a kind of a vivid thing. That's what gets people talking. And then when they talk, he would say, I am doing this because the word naked or stripped down in Hebrew is the same word used for exile because you're stripped away from your land. You're denuded from your homeland when you go into exile. So he uses a pun in Hebrew to, and he illustrates it by wearing just underwear in public off and on for three years. These are enactment prophecies. But once you understand how they work, you say, well, it's so simple. Yes, it is. But unless somebody explains it to you, unless you take the trouble to explain that form to somebody in your Bible study, they may be wondering about it. Structure, then, is how the ingredients of any given literary form are put together. Paul's letters. Every one of Paul's letters is bifid, B-I-F-I-D. They always start with, they have a certain structure overall, but the big, and I've listed that there, but the big chunk is in the first half, you have the theological exposition, and then somewhere in the, uh, it, there's a shift, and Paul starts to say, so how then do we take these theological truths and live them out? And then the 23rd Psalm, we talked about that last night, the way that you have a metaphor shift from being a sheep to being a guest at God's house. S the structure is powerful. Or Jesus' similitudes, the kingdom of God is like. He has dozens and dozens of these. And when you put them all together, you begin to realize this is a great way to learn about the kingdom of God, a certain kind of comparison structure. Then, what else, who else can help you? We're near the very end of these steps. This is actually step 11 now. Um, well, study Bibles, commentaries, Bible dictionaries, specialized books, um, uh, books that uh, are there to help you deal with problems. A wonderful book called, uh, actually two volumes, Hard Sayings of the Bible, edited by Walter Kaiser and others, has uh, several hundred of the frequently asked questions when people are saying, what is that supposed to mean? Or really? Is the Bible telling me to do that? So that's terrific. And then something like the NIV application commentary is wonderful in helping you answer the so question. Who else can help you? Well, it's not just books, it's also people. And be part of all these kinds of opportunities. Take advantage of them. They are there. The, the, uh, ask yourself always, in my learning the Bible, in my learning to be a wise and accurate interpreter of God's Word so that I do fulfill His will and not just figure out on my own what I think it might mean or guess at it. Um, people are your allies. Use them. Go where they are. Listen to them. Now, I know I'm preaching to the crowd because you said, oh, man, one of the great geniuses ever to come out of Massachusetts in the last 20 minutes is here, and so we can go hear him. Um, and then what kind of context, life context can help you? Where might you go? And the answer is, of course, the highest level on earth is the Zenos Summer Institute, and it goes down from there. And then finally, the so. Uh, there again, I mentioned the NIV application commentary. Um, 
Don Carson wrote a wonderful book called Exegetical Fallacies. It's a great book. Easy read, but he takes a number of the most egregious mistakes that people commonly make when they read Scripture and warns you about them. Um, always ask what the comparable life issues are. Always say, what's going on in this passage that is, that is the kind of thing that I can understand and appreciate? Try to do that. Try to understand the life issues so that you can interpret wisely. Remember that no scriptures of private interpretation. You cannot say, listen, I know that the story about Balaam's donkey means such and such to you, but to me it means I talk too much. Uh, no, no, that's not it. You can't do that. And then by all means, you ought to read and reread and sell to others and buy on eBay and resell and text information about and everything else you can do with how to read the Bible book by book. Uh, where can we uh, read more about this, this process? You What a softball. <laughs> where can we read more about? The book is titled Old Testament Exegesis, written by a world-famous humble country scholar, <laughs> and uh, New Testament Exegesis. Really, those two books are not unreadable by anybody. Uh, but if you want to start, <clears throat> go to the Anchor Bible Dictionary and just read the article there on exegesis. And uh, I wrote it, and I made it simple, and I take you through the 12 steps, so it's doable. Okay. But, but this is not something ultra simple. You know, you might have taken high school algebra. Did you read that in second grade? No, you had to build up to it. And so, of course, there's a yeah. challenge to it. But uh, we've outlined it there. And in each of those books uh, on the exegesis, we list hundreds of individual resources. Great. If you want to know more about theology, here are lists of theology. If you want to know more about text, here are all the studies of text, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the books are written. They have been written. They're available. Okay. And you're going to pay me for asking that, right? I am, yeah. <laughs> Didn't you say $30 yeah, for the good ones and 20 for the sort of... We can of, talk yeah. about it later. Thank you. Um, I, you know, you need a budget in advance for this kind of guy. <laughs> Also, a lot of specific questions about the passages you were bringing up, <coughs> sure. questions about Hosea. Uh, sure. One person asked a question. He said, you know, commentaries are expensive. Is there a certain resource or no. a set of commentaries that you'd no. recommend for no. common no. man? Yeah, again, I want to plug Don Carson, who has paid me so that I had enough money to pay <laughs> you. But uh, Carson is one of the editors of the uh, New Bible Commentary. And in that commentary, they went to all the scholars who had written the highly technical commentaries and said, write one that is more accessible. I had written on Jonah, for example, so I wrote Jonah in the New Bible Commentaries. That is terrific. Published by InterVarsity, New Bible Commentary. And then uh, even more accessible. And that's, by the way, that's not a terribly expensive book, and there's a lot of them around. Um, but also the new NIV study Bible, also edited by Carson. In that one, I did Hosea, for example, so I know about the process. And again, they went to the scholars who had written the big stuff, the really detailed, complicated, technical stuff that your pastor benefits from and reads because of his or her knowledge of the material, and then asked us to make it as clear as we possibly could and as brief as we possibly could. So those are like praises of the big, big picture that you could also get if you wanted to go to seminary and read for hours on end. You know, someone uh, asked last night, in regards to, and I'm thinking of, um, it's admirable that you obviously have a passion for teaching people how to interpret the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where, what that drives you. And someone asked, what, what has driven you to make that one of your, your main life's passions? Um, it's really just, uh, I think, a call to teaching. I was a high school senior, and your average idiot and troublemaker is a high school senior. And uh, God saved me, and he saved me through a, a group called a young, it was called a New Life Club, led by a Gordon College student. And uh, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, and, and so I became a Christian, began attending an a, a evangelical church, and so on and so on. And um, I began eventually 
teaching Sunday school, going to Bible study. We had a Bible study at, at, at Harvard where I went to college and uh, group meetings and so on. And, and I began to have opportunities to fulfill my calling. God said to me, clear as a bell, and I didn't have a vision per se, but I heard in my brain, you're going to teach theology in a theological school. I was called at age 16 to do that. Well, when God does that to you, you, you have a concomitant consequential interest. And you say, okay, I got to learn to teach this stuff. And so you get opportunities to teach it. And as you teach it, you realize the materials aren't as good as they could be. I, I think I could say this even better. And you pray hard, God help me to say it right. You try it out on students, and I have lots of students who uh, have read the proto versions of all the things I've written, and then you see how it works. And if people say, this is great, it helps me, I'm so glad this works, this works, and you see the excellent papers they write and the things they tell you, and you see the responses, and so it's a reinforcement. God reinforces what you're doing. So it's like anything else that you might have a love for. And so, as I mentioned, I decided not to go into professional basketball, um, uh, be beca really because I was too tall. But uh, I, I did. Uh, I mean, I, I could have done that and failed very early on. But uh, instead, God, God had called me and given me a job assignment very specifically. Doesn't usually happen that way. And so I've had the pleasure then of doing what he knew in advance I would be able to do to whatever degree I've been successful. He gets the glory, not me. You, you, the only difference between any of us and a speck of dust is the grace of yeah. God. So we cannot give any credit to ourselves. We can't say, you know, as I was being gestated in the womb, I began to become uh, inclined in this or that direction, and I'm so proud of myself. You can't. <laughs> well, you've been a, a blessing to us here. Um, last question, a couple people were asking about uh, the difference between this type of study and personal time in the Word. Do you believe there is a difference, and what does your time, your regular yeah. devotional time look like? Yeah, I would argue, by the way, I get paid to study the Bible. So I know that's unusual. It's pretty nice, uh, but that's how it works. <laughs> but most people don't. I don't think there needs to be. I, I, I think that it's very important that you be as careful a scholar, at whatever level you can do it, as careful and accurate as you possibly can be. And these methods would work for anybody in their devotional time. But the devotional time is the place at which you most strongly ask the question, so, and you most strongly ask God directly for that question. Okay, God, would you help me understand it? So it's the addition of prayer, and it's the dialogue with God, trusting that he will put into your brain the things he needs you to know from his word. It's all there. It's everything we need to know is there. It does the job. It, it, there's no, nothing else that needs to be added to it. God knew perfectly well there'd be a 21st century and that you and I would exist, and he's happy with and satisfied with what he produced in the Bible. It will do the work if we're prayerful, if we're humble, and if we don't forget to ask, so? 